I have a bright star and and I have a line that I've drawn. That's a yarn. That's a yarn. And a beautiful star. Look at that, don't that be? When did this star happen? Right now, summer rocks. Night summer rocks. Hi, Lemon. Hello, Lemon. I was bored, so I came to watch you. Well, I'm going to be reading instead of playing games tonight. I'm giving myself a break. So, hello, Lemon. Hello, Lemon. We love Lemon, don't we? We love Lemon. Hi, Ricky. Say hi, Ricky. I love you, Ricky. Foxy's so sweet. Look at her. <laughs> oh, why are you sad? Yeah, I just needed a, needed a little break. We've done a lot of the games. I'll be um, gaming again tomorrow, but my brain's a little <laughs> jellified. I just got out of um, out of foreign language class. I'm taking Vietnamese. Let me grab you what my homework looks like. So, I am learning. I missed my neck. Oh, Ugg, Ugg Khan, hello. Okay. So, I'm taking Vietnamese and I'm working on accents. And let me, let me show you how crazy this is. So, this is the same word. Well, you can barely see it because of light. Okay, well, just take, take my word for it. So this is the same word. So one, two, three, four, five, six different ways to say one word and each one has a different meaning. So it's like ba, 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 ba. Like and they all, and it's like that for the whole thing. And then not only that, you have to learn not just little accents that, that we're used to, but more on top of that and then accents that um, stack on top of each other. Like, let's see if you guys can see. Yeah, so there's a squiggle here and then a the little liney thing next to it, a squiggle thing and another little line. It's, ooh, it's a lot. Hi, Marshall, I dated a girl once. She was born and raised from Vietnam. Well, there you go. Um, but. It's going well. She took me to eat pho one time. It was so good. We have a great pho place next to us, actually. It's been a while since I've eaten there because I was burning out. But um, today we're going to continue with the book we've been reading, um, Name of the Wind by Patrick Rothfuss. I love this book. Um, last time we did a stream, it was real busy in here with trolls. So I've got all of my chats lined and ready so I can take care of that when it comes in. Um, the community chat is over here. The only chat, hi, Mimic Gorilla, good to see you. The only chat you won't see in this box will be that from Facebook. For some reason, Facebook isn't syncing to um, our restream chat anymore, but the people on Mixer, Twitch, and YouTube will be able to communicate with each other should they choose to. We did like three hours of this. How am I? I'm doing good. Um, it's a nice cold day here. It was hammering rain. I had physical therapy and language class. So, and I also studied for my real estate exam as well um, that I have to retake. So, just go ahead and get into the book. Kavov could do it in 11 hours. Kelsey! <laughs> Hello! Yup. <laughs> so, yeah, it took us three hours to get only to page 65, but that's because I was fielding a lot of questions about the book to you guys. And also, my reading was a little slow, but hopefully I've gotten a little bit better. Nuke and I have been reading bedtime stories to one another before we go to sleep, so hopefully this will help. I just need a break from um, the games for the evening. <clears throat> Chapter 9 riding in the, wagon, in the wagon with Ben. Abanthi was the first Arcanist I ever met, a strange, exciting figure to a young boy. He was knowledgeable in all the sciences, 
botany, astronomy, physio, well, psychology. I almost said physiology. Blah, blah, blah. If you don't, res if I don't respond in ten minutes, it's probably because you made me fall asleep. That is the goal. Lay down, relax. If you want to go to sleep, go to sleep. Same. <laughs> psychology, anatomy, alchemy, geology, chemistry, and just as you start to fall asleep, I will scream. <laughs> Cause I'm a troll. <laughs> he was portly, with twinkling eyes that moved quickly from one thing to another. He had a strip of dark gray hair running around the back of his head, but, and this was what I remember most about him, no eyebrows. Rather, he had them, but they were a perpetual state of regrowing from being burned off in the course of his alchemical pursuits made him look surprised and quizzical all at once. A uh, fun fact about my mother, her eyebrows are basically translucent. Um, I drew them on her one time just because I wanted to see what she looked like with eyebrows. Gazed at her in horror and had to promptly scrub her face. <laughs> like, <laughs> it wasn't because she wanted to, I just had the stuff to do it. And I wanted to know if my mom looked more like me with eyebrows. The answer is no. But it also probably didn't help that I drew her eyebrows like this. <laughs> I should have recorded it to share with you all. I felt so bad. I'm like, mom, please forgive me. She's like, we'll never talk of this again. <laughs> Some people are not destined for eyebrows. He spoke gently, laughed often, and never exercised his wit at the expense of others. He cursed like a drunken sailor with a broken leg, but only to his donkeys. Oh yeah, I forgot I was calling you guys my donkeys. Hey donkeys, if you're going to enjoy the stream, before you go to sleep, don't forget to like, follow, subscribe, do all the thingamajigs if you haven't done so already. Get donkeys. Totally forgot about that. He cursed at them like a drunken sailor with a broken leg. They were called Alpha and Beta and avidly fed them carrots and lumps of sugar when he thought no one was looking. Chemistry was his particular love, and my father said he'd never known a man to run a better still. By his second day in our troop, I was making a habit of riding in his wagon. I would ask him questions and he would answer. Then he would ask for songs and I would pluck them out for him on the lute I borrowed from my father's wagon. He would even sing from time to time. He had a bright, reckless tenor that always loved wandering off, looking for notes in the wrong places. Hi, Jason. Great to have you. More often than not, he stopped and laughed at himself when it happened. He was a good man, and there was no conceit in him. Not long after he joined our troop, I asked Avonthe what it was like being an arcanist. He gave me a thoughtful look. Have you ever known an arcanist? I paid one to men a cracked axle on the road once, I paused to think. He was headed inland with a caravan on a fish. Abenthe made a dismissive gesture. No, no, boy, I'm talking about an arcanist, not some poor chill charmer who works his way back and forth across the, car the caravan routes trying to f keep fresh meat from rotting. What's the difference? I asked, sensing it was expected of me. Well, I should probably start doing voices again, huh? <clears throat> well, he said, that might take a bit of explaining. I've got nothing but time. Abanthi gave me an appraising look. I've been waiting for it. It was the look that said, you don't sound as young as you look. I hope you, <laughs> I probably don't want to sound like a, uh, like a wise guy, eh? <laughs> oh well, B-movie reading right here. I'd hope he'd come to grips with that fairly soon. It gets tiresome to being spoken to as if you're a child, even if you happen to be one. He took a deep breath. 
just because someone knows trick or two doesn't mean there are they're an arcanist. They might know how to set a bone or read Eldvit Vit Vintic. I can't even read. Maybe they even know a little symphony, but oh sympathy. Sympathy, I interrupted as politely as possible. You'd probably call it magic, Apathy said reluctantly. It's not really, he shrugged. But even knowing sympathy doesn't make you an arcanist. A true arcanist has worked his way through the arcanum at the university. I am tired, so good night and take care. Good night, Lemon. Sleep well. At his mention of the arcanum, I bristled with two dozen new questions. Not... Not so many, you might think, but when you added them to the half hundred questions I carried with me wherever I went, I was stretched nearly to burst. Only through a severe effort of will did I remain silent, waiting for Apathy to continue on his own. Apathy, however, noticed my reaction. So you've heard about the Arcanum, have you? He seemed amused. Tell me what you've heard, then. This small prompt was all the excuse I needed. I heard from a boy in Temper Glen that if your arm's cut off, they can sew it back on at the university. Can they really? So stories say Tadlorin the Great um, went there to learn the names of all things. There's this library of a thousand books. Are there really that many? He answered the last question, the others having rushed by too quickly to, for him to respond. More than a thousand, actually. Ten times ten thousand books. More than that. More books than you could ever read. Abathy's voice grew vaguely wistful. More books than I could ever read? Somehow I doubted that. Ben continued. The, he the people you see riding with caravans, charmers, who keep food from spoiling, dowsers, fortune tellers, toad eaters, aren't real arcanists any more than traveling performers are Edmund Ra. They might know a little alchemy, a little sympathy, a little medicine shook his head, but they're not arcanists. A lot of people pretend to be. They wear robes, they put on airs to take advantage of the ignorant and gullible. But here's how you tell a true arcanist. Canis. Abathy pulled a fine chain over his head and handed it to me. It was the first time I'd ever seen an arcanum gilder. It looked rather unimpressive, just a flat piece of lead with some unfamiliar writing stamped onto it. That is the true gilf or Gilder if you prefer. Abanthi explained with some satisfaction. It's the only sure way to be certain of who is and who isn't an arcanist. Your father asked me to see mine before he let me ride with your troop. It shows he's a man of the world. He watched me with a sly disinterest. Uncomfortable, isn't it? I gritted my teeth and nodded. My hand had gotten numb as soon as I touched it. I was curious to study the markings on the front and back, but after a space of two breaths, my arm was numb to the shoulder, as if I had spent slept on it all night. I wondered if my whole body would go numb if I held it long enough. I was prevented from finding out. As the wagon hit a bump and my numb hand almost let Abathy's gilder fall onto the footboard of the wagon, he snatched it up and slipped it back on over his head, chuckling. How can you stand it? I asked, rubbing a little bit of feeling back into my hand. It only feels that way to other people, he explained. To its owner, it's just warm. That's how you can tell the difference between an arcanist and someone who has a knack for finding water or guessing the weather. Trip has something like that, I said. He rolls sevens. That's a little different, Avanthi laughed. Not anything so un unexplainable. Not anything so unexplainable as a knack. He slapped a little further down into his seat. Probably for the best. A couple hundred years ago, a person was good as dead if folks saw he had a neck. The Talons called them demon signs, and burnt folk, folk if they had them. Avanthi's mood seemed to have taken a downward turn. Dun dun dun, now we're talking about Moida. We had to break trip out of jail once or twice, he said. I said trying to lighten the tone of the conversation, but no one actually tried to burn him. Avanthi gave a tired smile. I suspect I suspect Trip had a pair of clever dice, or an equally clever skill which probably extends to cards as well. 
I thank you for your timely warning, but a knack is something else entirely. I can't abide being patronized. Tripp can't cheat to save his life, I said more sharply than I had intended. And anyone in the troop can tell good dice from bad. Trip throws sevens. It doesn't matter whose dice he uses, he rolls sevens. If he bets on someone, they roll sevens. If he so much as bumps a table with loose die on it, seven. Hmm, Abinthi nodded to himself. My apologies. That does sound like a neck. I'd be curious to see it. I nodded. Take your own dice. We haven't let him play for years. The thought occurred to me. It might not still work. He shrugged. Knacks don't go away as easily as that. When I was growing up in, in Stop, I was a young man with a knack. Uncommonly, uncommonly good with plants. Abinthi's grin was gone as he looked off at something I couldn't see. His tomatoes would be red while everybody else's vines were still climbing. His squashes were bigger and sweeter. His grapes didn't hardly have to be bottled before they started to become wine. He trailed off, his eyes far away. Did they burn him? I asked with a morbid curiosity of the young. What? No, of course not. Hello, Coldblood84. Welcome. What? No, of course not. I'm not that old. He scowled at me in mocks. Um, I can't think of how to say that word right now. Severity. There we go. It's not that hard. There was a drought when he got run out of town. His poor mother was heartbroken. There was a moment of silence, two wagons ahead of us. I heard Tara and Shandy rehearsing lines from the swine herd and the nightingale. Abathy seemed to be listening as well, in an off-handed way. After Taran got himself lost halfway through Fane's garden monologue, I turned back to face him. Do they teach acting at the university? I asked. Abathy shook his head, slightly amused at the question. Many things, but not that. I looked over at Abathy and saw him watching me, his eyes dancing. Could you teach me some of those other things? I asked. He smiled. And it was as easy as that. That's clever writing. I really like that. Thank you for creeping. Welcome to the stream. Very clever writing. I just, I don't know. I always appreciate authors that kind of don't lay it out for you and don't at the same time. Yeah. And close together as well. I really enjoy that. Just as much as when you're watching a movie or reading a book and they somehow sneak their title <laughs> into the thing itself. Where am I from? I am from California. Abinthi proceeded to give me a brief overview of each of the sciences. While his main love was for chemistry, he believed in a, a rounded education. I learned how to work a sextant the compass, the slipstick, the abacus. More important, I learned to do without. Within a span, I could identify any chemical in his cart. In two months, I could distill liquor until it was too strong to drink, bandage a wound, set a bone, and diagnose hundreds of sicknesses from symptoms. I knew the process for making four different aphrodisiacs, three concoctions for conception, nine for impotence, two um, filatries referred to to simply as Maiden's Helper. <laughs> I wouldn't think it was rather vague about the purpose of the last of these, but I had some strong suspicions. <laughs> nice, you're from the UK. Isn't it really late there for you? Why are you still awake or are you just waking up? I learned the formula for a dozen poisons and acids and a hundred medicines and cure-alls, some of which even worked. I doubled my herb lore in theory, if not in practice. Abinthi started to call me Red, and I called him Ben, first in retaliation and then in friendship. Only now, far after the fact, do I recognize how carefully Ben prepared me for what was to come at the university. He did it subtly. Once or twice a day mixed in with normal lectures, Ben would present me with a little mental exercise I would have to master before we went on to anything else made me play tyranny without a board, keeping track of the stones in my head. 
Other times, he would stop in the middle of a conversation and make me repeat everything I had said in the last few minutes, word for word. Is this a murder mystery? No. This is, um, this is an epic journey, um, where we are going to kill kings, kill demons, go to school, fight bullies, do all sorts of stuff. Like, this book... It, it's not like a beginning, middle, end. This is a continuous story that doesn't stop. So you're always at the good part, I feel, of the book. At least for this first one. The second book, I have I have my... We'll talk about it when we get there. But no, it's high fantasy. Or fantasy, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Let's see, where was I? Hmm, okay. This was levels beyond the simple memorization I had practiced for the stage. My mind was learning to work in different ways, becoming stronger. I felt the same way your body feels after a day of splitting wood or swimming or sex. You feel exhausted, languorous, and almost godlike. This feeling was similar, except for it was my intellect that was weary and expanded, languid and blatantly powerful. I could feel my mind starting to awaken. It seemed to gain momentum as I progressed. Like, when water starts to wash away a dam made out of sand. I don't know if any of you understand what a geometric progression is, but that is the best way to describe it. Through it all, Ben continued to teach me mental exercises that I was half convinced he was con convinced he constructed out of sheer meanness. Ben held up a chunk of Oh, sorry. Chapter 10. I always skip those parts. Alar and the several stones. Ben held up a chunk of dirty field stone slightly bigger than his fist. What will happen if I let go of this rock? I thought for a bit. Simple questions during lesson time were very seldom simple. Finally, I gave the obvious answer. It will fall. I raised, he raised an eyebrow. I had kept him busy over the last several months, and he hadn't had the leisure to accidentally burn them off. Probably. You sound like a sophist boy. Hasn't always fallen before? I stuck my tongue out at him. <laughs> Don't try to boldface your way through this one. That's a fallacy. You taught me that yourself. He grinned. Fine. Would it be fair to say that you would believe it would fall? Fair enough. I want you to believe it will fall up when I let go of it. His grin widened. I tried. It was like doing mental gymnastics. After a while, I nodded. Okay. How well do you believe in it? Not very well, I admitted. I want you to believe this rock will float away. Believe in it with faith that will move mountains and shake trees. He paused and seemed to take a different track. Do you believe in God? Telu? After a fashion, not good enough. Do you believe in your parents? I gave a little smile. Sometimes. I can't see them right now. He snorted and unhooked the slapstick he used to give good alpha and beta when they were getting too lazy. Do you believe in this, Alir? He only called me Alir when he thought I was being especially willful and obstinate. He held out the stick for my inspection. Your little son, there was little son, little son, little a malicious glitter in his eye. I decided not to tempt fate. Yes, I believe in the stick. How am I doing? I'm doing great. I'm enjoying reading to you guys. Oh, Anton, thank you so much for the host. I really appreciate that. And Ramon, thank you for sharing the stream. Good. He slapped the side of the wagon with it. Produced a sharp crack. One of the alpha... One of Alpha's ears pivoted around at the noise, uncertain to whether or not it was directed at her. That's the sort of belief I want. It's called al Alar. Alar? Not really sure on the pronunciation. We'll call it Alar. It's called Alar, riding crop belief. When I drop the stone, it will flow away free as bird. 
Coldblood, thank you for hosting me. I really appreciate it. Love loving the story so good. Thank you, Babel Ace. I appreciate that. Um, if you want to end up getting yourself, this is what it looks like. Patrick Rothfuss, Name of the Wind. I have it up here in case anyone is curious. Or if you own the book and want to read with me. Okay. He brandished the slapstick a bit. And none of your petty philosophy. I want you to believe the stone will float away free as a bird. He brandished his slapstick. And none of your petty philosophy or I'll make you sorry you ever took a shining to this little game. I nodded, cleared my mind with one of the tricks I'd already learned, and bore down on believing. And I started to sweat. After what may have been ten minutes, I nodded again. He let go of the rock, and it fell. And I began to get a headache. He picked up. He picked the rock back up. Do you believe that it floated? No, I skulked, rubbing my temples. Good, it didn't. Never fool yourself into perceiving things that don't exist. It's fine to. It's a fine line to walk, but sympathy is not an arc, art of the weak wield. He held out the rock again. Do you believe this rock? Do you believe it will float? It didn't. It doesn't matter. Try again. He shook the stone. A lair is the cornerstone of sympathy. If you are going to impose your will on the world, you have to have control over what you believe. I tried and tried. It was the most difficult thing I had ever done. It took almost all afternoon. Finally, Ben was able to drop the rock, and I retained my firm belief that it would fall despite evidence on the contrary. I heard the thump of the rock, and I looked at Ben. I've got it, I said calmly, feeling more, more than a little smug. He looked at me out the corner of his eye, as if he didn't quite believe me, but didn't want to admit it. He picked the rock up absently with a fingernail, then shrugged and held it up again. I want you to believe the rock will fall, and the rock will not fall, when I let go of it, <laughs> he grinned. I went to bed late that night. I had a nosebleed and a smile of satisfaction. I held the two separate beliefs loosely in my mind and let the singing discord lull me into senselessness. So basically what he had to do is he had to believe two things at once. He had to separate his conscious. So not just think that I hold this rock, this rock will float and then it obviously falls so he had to believe that the rock would fall and flow at the same time it's it's a weird way of thinking but once you like dive into it it maybe you have to see it for yourself to understand um what he's trying to convey but it's real cool it's so awesome I held the two separate beliefs loosely in my mind and let their singing discord lull me into senselessness. Being able to think about two de um, disparate things at once, aside from being wonderfully efficient, was roughly akin to being able to sing harmony with yourself. Yes, that's perfect. That's a perfect way to put it. So if you could have the ability to sing a harmony with yourself, then then that's what it would be. Pretty smile. I bet you have a pretty smile too. I just, I love cleverness. I think I, yeah, goof, like being goofy, being a goofball, and then being clever. I love those things. It's hard to believe in po total opposites. This is true, Badalese. This is very true. It turned into a but this turned into a favorite game of mine. After two days of practicing, I was able to sing in trio. Soon, I was doing the mental equivalent of palming cards and juggling knives at the same time. There were so many other lessons, though none were quite as pivotal as the Allaire. Ben taught me Heart of Stone, a mental exercise that lets you set aside your emotions and prejudices and lets you think clearly about whatever you wished. Ben said a man who truly mastered Heart of Stone could go to his sister's funeral without ever shedding a tear. So fun fact about me, I used to not really have emotions. Um, I was very walled off 
but ever since meeting um, my fiance, um, he taught me like how to properly have emotions like a normal person, and now they're too much for me, <laughs> and I have emotions all the time, and I hate it, <laughs> so I need to find a middle ground. <laughs> I'm all over the place. He also taught me a game called Seeking the Stone. The point of the game was to have one part of your mind hide in an imaginary stone in an imaginary room. The m then you have the other separate part of your mind try to find it. Practically, it teaches valuable m mental control. If you can really play Seek the Stone, then you are developing an iron heart of the, uh, of the sort you need for sympathy. However, while being able to think about two things at the same time is terribly convenient, the training it takes to get there is frustrating at best and other times rather disturbing. I remember one time, I looked for the stone for almost an hour before I consented to ask for the other half of me where I had hidden it, only to find I hadn't hidden the stone at all. I would merely been waiting to see how long I would look before giving up. Have you ever been annoyed and amused with yourself at the same time? It's an interesting feeling to say the least. Another time, I asked for hints and ended up jeering at myself. It's no wonder that, that many arcanists you meet are a little eccentric, if not downright correct. As Ben said, sympathy is not for the weak of mind. That is so cool, and that's something I would totally do. If I could split my mind in half and play the stone game, I wouldn't hide the stone at all. I would. <laughs> I would totally mess with me <laughs> and laugh. <laughs> for my own evil amusement but it's hard to believe in the to in total opposites it is but if you think about it um say you're having a debate with someone and this this takes quite a while to do like say you're having an argument or a debate being able to see both sides at once is a good place to start for training yourself to do something like that i guess it takes a lot of patience and eventually skill to get to that point but it might be sort of kind of possible but then again this is just a book it's a book and a way of life <laughs> mm -hmm. chapter 11 the binding of iron i sat in the back of apathy's wagon it was a wonderful place for me home to a hundred bottles and bundles saturated with thou a thousand smells. To my young mind, it was usually more fun than a, than a tinker's cart, but not today. It had rained heavily the night before, and the road was a thick morass of mud. Since the troop was not in any particular schedule, we had decided to wait for a day or two to give the roads time to dry. It was a fairly common occurrence, and it had happened to fall at the perfect time for Ben to further my education. So I sat on the wooden work table in the back of Ben's wagon and chafed at wasting the day listening to him lecture about things I already understood. My thoughts must have been apparent because Abinthi sighed and sat down next to me. Not quite what you expected, eh? I relaxed a bit, knowing his tone meant temporarily reprieve from the lecture. He gathered up a handful of iron draps that were sitting on the table and cleaned them together thoughtfully in his hand. He looked at me. Did you learn to juggle all at once? Five balls at a time, knives too? I flushed a bit at the memory. Trip hadn't even let me try three balls at first. He made me juggle too. I'd even dropped them a couple times. I, I told Ben so. Right, Ben said. Master this trick and you get to learn another. I expected him to stand up and start back into lesson, but he didn't. Instead, he held out the handful of iron drafts. What do you know about these? He crowded them together in his hand. In what respect, I asked. Physically, chemically, historically, historically, he grinned. Astound me with your grasp of historical uh, minutia, Elir. Minutia, Elir. I had asked him what Elir meant once. He claimed it meant wise one, but I had my, my doubts from the way his mouth quirked when he said it. Light can't be dark, and dark can't be light. What about golden hour and the mornings and golden hours in the afternoon? How about, I'll tell you this, 
Good night, Marshall. Sleep well. Good night, Ramon. Sleep well. I drove to see my brothers last year. They live in the big deserts out in uh, Arizona. And I can probably hear that. That's loud. Wait for that. It's loud. We'll wait for that to stop so I can think. About to find out how good this mic is. Flash. Yep. Okay, so I'm going out to um, visit my brothers, and there's no light pollution. There's nothing around, and we're just I'm just driving by myself, and I'm looking at the sky. It's starting. It's it's past golden hour, and you can see the sky. It's it's perfectly half black just this line that goes down and I'm just driving and it's both at once the right hand side the sky is so black and then it's semi blue and then it's just this very pale color and this the sun is already basically gone dark is the absence of light this is true but I guess I, I'm a person that believes that there are always gray areas. I don't know. Like there's complete, there's darkness, there's blackness. It just depends on what gradient you're looking for. But I'm never going to forget that memory. It was, it was like being in the dark and in the light at the same time. It was, it still blows my mind. Let's see. Historically, blah, blah, blah. A long time ago, the people who, how long ago, frowned at him in mock severity. Roughly 2,000 years ago, the nomadic folk who roamed the foothills around the Shadala Mountains were brought together under one chieftain. What was his name? Heldred. His sons were Heldim and Heldar. Would you like to know his entire lineage, or should I get to the point? I glowered at him. Sorry, sir. Ben sat up straight in his seat and assumed such an aspect of rapt attention that we both broke into grins. I started again. Heldred eventually controlled the foothills around the Shadala. This meant that he controlled the mountains themselves. They started to plant cro crops. Their nomadic lifestyle was abandoned and they slowly began to get to the point, Amethy asked, tossing drabs onto the table in front of me. I ignored him as best I could. They controlled the only plentiful and easily accessible source of metal for a great distance. Soon, they were the most skilled workers of those metals as well. They exploited this advantage and gained a great deal of wealth and power. Until this point, barter that was until this point, barter was the most common method of trade. Some larger cities coined their own currency, but outside of the cities, money was only worth the weight of the metal. Kind of like gold is, right? You lived in Arizona and I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Alexis, magic, right? So glad you guys like are right on the nose. Bars of metal were better for bartering, but full bars of metal were inconvenient to carry. Ben gave me his best bored student face. The effect was only slightly inhibited by the fact that he had burned his eyebrows off again only two days ago. <laughs> You're not going to go into the merits of repossessional currency, are you? It's amazing, the sunsets and the stars. The sunrises in Arizona. I had to watch a lot of those when I was in basic, not basic, um, in AIT. I took a deep breath and resolved not to pester Ben so much when he was lecturing me. The no longer nomads called the Chaldeum by now were the first established and standardized currency. Oh, Chaldeum. By cutting one of these smaller bars into five pieces, you get five drabs. I began to piece two rows of five drabs together to illustrate my point. They resembled little ingots of metal. Ten drabs were the same as a copper jot. Ten jots? Good enough. Ben broke in, start startling me. So these two drabs, he held up a pair for my inspection, could have come from the same bar, right? Actually, they probably cast them individually. I trailed off right under the glare. Sure. So there's something still connecting them, right? 
He gave me the look again. Didn't really agree, but I knew better than to interrupt. Right. He set them both on the table. So when you move one, the other should move. Right? I agreed for the sake of argument, then reached out to move one, but Ben stopped my hand, shaking his head. You've got to remind them first. You've got to convince them, in fact. So now we're looking at these, um, these drabs, this currency. We have to convince them. So in effect, we're telling an inanimate object that it has a consciousness and therefore is not an inanimate object. Think about that. He brought out a bowl and decanted a slow bob blob of pine pitch into it. He dipped one of the drops into the bitch and stuck another one in and spoke several words I didn't recognize and slowly put the bits apart, strands of pitch stretching between them. He set one on the table, keeping the other in his hand, and he muttered something else and relaxed. He raised his hand and the drab on the table mimicked the motion. He danced his hand around the brown piece of iron bobbed in the air. He looked from me to the coin. The law of sympathy is one of the most basic parts of magic. It states that the more similar the two objects are, the greater the sympathetic link. The greater the link, the more easily they influence one another. Your definition is circular. He set down the coin. His lecture's facade gave away to a grin as he tried with marginal success to wipe the pitch off his hands with a rag. He thought for a while. Seems pretty useless, doesn't it? I gave a hesitant nod. Trick questions were fairly common around lesson time. Would you prefer rather how to call the wind? His eyes danced to me. He murmured a word and the canvas ceiling of the wagon wrestled around us. I felt a grin capture my face, wolfish. Too bad, Elir. His grin was wolfish, too. And savage. You need to learn your letters before you can write. You need to learn the fingerings on the strings before you can play and sing. He pulled out a piece of paper and jo jotted a couple words onto it. The trick is... The trick is in holding the Elir from your, firm in your mind. You need to believe that they are connected... You need to know they are. He handed me the paper. Here is the phonetic pronunciation. It's called the symp sympathetic bonding of parallel motion. Practice. He looked even more lupine than before, old and grizzled with no eyebrows. He left to wash his hands and I cleared my mind using heart of stone. Soon I was floating on a sea of dispassionate calm. I stuck two bits of metal into together with the pine pitch. I fixed my mind with the allure and the writing crop belief that the two drafts were connected. I said the words, pulled the coins apart, and spoke the last word and waited. No rush of power, no flash of hot or cold, no radiant beam of light struck me. I was rather disappointed, at least as disappointed as I could be in Heart of Stone. I lifted the coin in my hand, and the coin on the table lifted itself in similar fashion. It was magic, there was no doubt about it. But I felt rather underwhelmed. I had been expecting, I don't know what I had been expecting, but it wasn't this. Dope Builds Gaming, welcome back. Be sure to smash that like button. For sure, you guys, um, don't forget if you happen to be um, Strim Stram streamers or other content creators on the website and you feel like checking other people out, Go subscribe to Dope Builds Gaming. Everybody needs help growing. Wait, what? What are we doing here? Story time. Love the fire. Thank you. It's all 4K TV because we live in an apartment right now. Uh. Let me see. Where was I? I got so engrossed into it and then I saw the chat moving so I said, how to say hello. And if you guys haven't used your um, Amazon Prime yet and want to feel like getting into that sub goal with me, 
feel free to use it on your girl. I play games. I read books. I, I do all the yes, yeah, sisters. Oh, sorry, brothers. No, no. I won't call you by sexes. I'm just going to call you donkeys. <laughs> all right, donkeys. Like and subscribe. Okay, so he was a little underwhelmed. The rest of the day was spent experimenting with simple, sympathetic binding Abbott they had, had taught me. I learned them that almost anything could be bound together. An iron drab, a silver tenant, a stone, a piece of fruit, two bricks, a cloth of earth, and one of the donkeys. It took me about two hours to figure out that the pitch pine wasn't necessary. When I asked him, Ben admitted that it was merely an aid for concentration. I think he was surprised I figured out how to out, figured that out without being told. Let me sum up sympathy very quickly since you will probably never need never need to have anything other than a rough comprehension of how these things work. First, energy cannot be created or destroyed. When you are lifting one drab and the other rises off the table, the one in your hand feels as heavy as if you're lifting both because in fact you are. That's in theory. In practice, it feels as if you're lifting three drabs. No sympathetic link is perfect. The more dissimilar the objects are, the more energy is lost. Think of it as a leaky aqueduct leading to a water wheel. A good sympathetic link has very few leaks and most energy is used. A bad link is full of holes and with very little, very little of the effort that you put goes into it um, goes towards what you want it to do. For instance, I tried linking a piece of chalk and a glass bottle of water. There was very little similarity between the two. So even though the bottle of water might have weighed two pounds, if I tried to le lift the chalk, it felt like 60 pounds. The best link I found was a tree branch I had broken in half. After I understood the little piece of sympathy, Ben taught me others. A dozen dozen sympathetic bindings a hundred little tricks for channeling power each of them was a different word in a vast vocabulary i was just beginning to speak quite often it was tedious and i'm not even telling you half of it then continued giving me the smattering of lessons in other areas history arithmetic chemistry but i grabbed onto whatever he could teach me about sympathy he doled out his secrets sparingly making me prove I mastered one before giving me another. But I seemed to have a knack for it, above and beyond my natural penchant for absorbing knowledge, so there was never a long wait. I was about to crash. I love a great storytelling. Snuggles in the chair. <laughs> well, you can snuggle in the bed and listen to me and fall asleep. So, in case you didn't catch that, he's learning about sympathetic bindings. So that he can move two things at once. Two similar objects, one in his hand, one on the table. But because of a sympathetic link, he lifts this. This will lift with it, like, but this will float. However, this has no weight because the weight of this is actually here and then some. So it feels heavy. Say you were to do the piece of paper and everything I have around here is paper and this piece of metal. You would have to think really hard about one, do they have anything in common, any similarity at all? Even so, because they are so dissimilar, this wouldn't just feel like a little weight this could end up being 60 pounds instead of just feeling like a few sheets of paper that it, depending on what you're trying to move could get you killed or really easy really really easy man i love thinking about this guy it's it's stuff like that that keeps me up at night after i read a book and get all cozy and
I don't mean to imply that the road was always smooth. The same curiosity that made me so such an eager student also led me into trouble with fair regularity. One evening, I was building up my parents' cook fire. My mother caught me chanting a rhyme. I'd heard it the day before, not knowing she was behind me. She overheard as I knocked one stick of firewood against another and absentmindedly recited. Seven things has Lady Lackless keeps them underneath her black dress. One a ring that's not for wearing. One a sharp word not for swearing. Right beside her husband's candle, there's a door without a handle. I don't feel like singing today, so I'm just doing the little blah blah blah. In a box, no litter locks, Blacklist keeps her husband's rocks. She's a secret there's a secret she's been keeping. She's been dreaming and not sleeping. On a road that's not for traveling. Blacklist lights her riddle rattling. I had heard a little girl chant it as she played hop skip. I'd only heard it twice, but I'd, but I had it stuck in my head. It was memorable as most chi uh, ch child rhymes were. But my mother heard me and came over to standing by the fire. What were you just saying, sweet? Her tone wasn't angry. I could tell she wasn't pleased either. Something I heard back in follows, I said evasively, running running off with town children was largely forbidden was a largely forbidden activity. Distrust dr blah, 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 I can't speak right now. I mean is it some water? Un momento. Enjoy the fire. Much better. Distrust, maybe I just can't say that word. Distrust turns quickly to dislike town and be polite. I laid some heavier sticks onto the fire and let the flames lick them. My mother was silent for a while, and I was beginning to hope she would leave it alone. When she, when she said, it's not a nice thing to be singing, have you stopped to think about what it's about? I hadn't actually. It seemed mostly a nonsense rhyme, but when I ran it through the back of my head, I saw, I saw the rather obvious sexual innuendo. I do. I didn't think about it before. Her expression grew a little gentler. She reached down and smoothed my hair. Always think about what you're singing, honey. I seemed to be out of trouble, but I couldn't keep from asking. How is it any different from the parts in All for His Waiting? Like when Fane asked Lady Perel about her hat. I'd heard about it from so many men. I wished to see it for myself and try to fit. It's pretty obvious what he's talking about. I watched her mouth grow firm. Not angry, but not pleased. Then something in her face changed. You tell me what the difference is, she said. I hated baited questions. The difference was obvious. One would get me in trouble and the other wouldn't. I waited a while to make it clear I'd given the matter proper consideration before I shook my head. My mother knelt lightly in front of the fire, warming her hands. The difference is, go fetch me the tripod, would you? She gave me a gentle push and I scampered off to go get it from the back of our wagon as she continued. The difference is saying something to a person and saying something about a person. The first might be rude and the second is always gossip. I brought the tripod back and helped her set, set it over the fire. 
Also, Lady Peral is just a character. Lady Lacklist is a real person with feelings that can be hurt. She looked up at me. I didn't know. I protested guiltily. I must have struck a sufficient piteous figure because she gathered me in for a hug and a kiss. It's nothing to cry over, sweet one. Just remember to always think about what you're doing. She ran her hand over my head and smiled like the sun. Imagine you could make it both make it up to both Lady Lackless and myself if you found some sweet nettle for the pot tonight. Any excuse to escape judgment and play for a while in the tingling of trees by the roadside was good enough for me. I was gone almost before the words left her mouth. I should also make it clear that much of the time I spent with Ben was my free time. I was still responsible for my normal duties with the troop. I acted the part of the young page when needed. I helped paint scenery and sew costumes. I rode down the horses at night and rattled the sheet of ten backstage when we needed thunder on stage. But I didn't bemoan the loss of my free time. A child's endless energy and my own insatiable lust for knowledge made the following year one of the happiest times I can remember. Chapter 12, Puzzle Pieces Fitting. Toward the end of the summer, I accidentally overheard a conversation that shook me out of my state of dis state of blissful ignorance. When we are children, we seldom think of the future. This innocence leaves us free to enjoy ourselves as few adults can. The day we fret about the future is the day we leave our childhood behind. It was evening, and the troop was camped by the side of the road. Avanthea had given me a new piece of sympathy to practice. The maximum of var variable heart transferred to constant motion or something pretentious like that. It was tricky, but it had fallen into place like a puzzle piece fitting. It had taken about 15 minutes from Avanthea's tone. I guess, I guess he had expected it to take three or four hours at least. So I went looking for him, partially to get my le next lesson and partially so that I could just be a little smug. I tracked him down at my parents' wagon. I heard the three of them long before I saw them. Their voices were just murmurs. The distance music a conversation makes when it's too dim for words. But I was coming close one day. I heard the word clearly. Shandrian. I pulled up short when I heard that. Everyone in the troop knew my father was working on a song. He'd been teasing old stories and rhymes from folklore over a year wherever we stopped to play. For months... It was stories about Lanier. He started gathering old fairy stories too, legends about bogies and shamble men, and he began to ask questions about the Chandrian. That was months ago. Over the last half year, he had asked more about the Chandrian and less about the Lanier, the Lyra, and the rest. Most songs my father set into writing were finished in a single season, while this one was stretching towards its second year. What? El, pa El Polo Paco. I am reading this evening. I've had a long day. You should know this as well. My father never let a word or whisper or a song be heard before it was ready to play. Only my mother was allowed into his confidence, as her hand was always in any song he had made. The cleverness was in the music. It was all his. The best words were hers. When you wait a few span or a month to hear a finished song, you anticipate the anticipation adds uh, savor, adds savor. But after a year, excitement begins to sour. By now, a year and a half had passed, and most folks were mad with curiosity. This occasionally led to harsh words when someone had caught wandering too little, a little too close to their wagon, while well, my father and mother were working. So I moved a little bit closer to my parents' fire, stepping softly. Eavesdropping is a deplorable habit. But I've developed the worst one since. Much about them, I heard Ben say. But I'm willing. 
I'm glad to talk with an educated man on the subject. My father's strong baritone was in contrast to Ben's tenor. I'm wary of those superstitious country folk in the... Someone added wood to the fire and I lost my father's words at the crackling that followed. Stepping as quietly as I dared, I moved to the long shadow of my parents' wagons. Like I'm chasing ghosts with this song, trying to piece together the story in a fool in a, is a fool's game. I wish I'd never started it. Nonsense, my mother said. This will be your best work and you know it. So you think there's a an original story to all for all this to stem from, Ben asked. A historical basis for Lanier. All signs point to it, my father said. It's like looking at a dozen grandchildren and seeing ten of them have blue eyes. You know the grandmother had blue eyes, too. I've done this before. I'm good at it. I wrote below the walls the same way, but I heard him sigh. What's the problem, then? The story's older, my mother explained. It's more like he's looking at great-great-grandchildren. Cool. And they're scattered to all four corners, my father groused. And when I finally do find one, it's got five eyes, two greens, a blue, a brown, and a chartreuse. The next one only has one eye and it changes colors. How am I supposed to draw conclusions from that? Ben cleared his throat. A disturbing analogy, he said. But you're welcome to pick my brain about the Chantry Inn. I've heard a lot of stories over the years. The first thing I need to know is how many there actually are, my father said. Most stories say seven, but even that's conflicted. Some say three, others five, and fellers fall. There was a full thirteen of them, one for each pont fit in in Arthur, and extra for the capital. That I can answer, Ben said. Seven. You can hold hold to that with some certainty. It's a it's part of their name. Actually. Chen means seven. Dian so Chendrian means seven of them. Chandrian. I didn't know that, my father said. Chan. What language is that? Yelish? It sounds like Tema. We've got a good year, Ben. It's Temic, actually. Predates Tema by about a thousand years. Well, that simplifies things, I heard my father say. I wish I asked you a month ago. I don't suppose you know why they do what they do. I could tell my father's tone he didn't really expect an answer. What's the real mystery, isn't it? Ben chuckled. I think that's what makes them more frightening than the rest of the bogeymen that you hear about in the stories. A ghost wants revenge. Demons want your soul. A shamble man is hungry and cold. It makes them less terrible. Things we understand we can try to control. But Shandrian come like lightning from the clear blue sky and are just destruction. No rhyme and no reason. My song will have both, my father said with a grin and determination. I think I've dug up the reason after all this while. I've teased it together from bits of the story. That's what's so galling about it all, to have the hard part of this done and have all the small specifics giving me such trouble. You think you know, Ben said curious, curiously. Oh, I did a thing. Come back thing. There we go. I gotta take comfortable. Oh. You think you know? What's your theory? My father gave a low chuckle. Oh no, Ben, you'll have to wait just like the others. I've sweated too long over the song to give away the heart before it's finished. I could hear the disappointment in Ben's voice. I'm sure this was all an elaborate ruse to keep me traveling with you, he groused. I won't be able to leave until I've heard the blackened thing. Then help us finish it, my mother said. The Chandrian signs are another key piece to the information we can't nail down. Everyone agrees there are signs that warn of their presence, but nobody agrees on what they are. Let me think, Ben said. Blue flames is obvious, of course, but I'd hesitate to attribute the Chandrian in particular. In some stories, it's a sign of demons, and others, it's fake creatures or magic of any sort. It shows bad air and minds too, my mother pointed out. Does it? My father asked. She nodded. 
When a lamp burns in the blue haze, you know there's a fire damp in the air. Good lord, fire damp in a coal mine? The feller said, blow out your light, get lost in the black, and leave it to burn the whole place down to the fenders. It's more frightening than any demon. I'll also admit the fact that certain arcanists occasionally use prepared candles or torches to impress gullible townsfolks, Ben said, clearing his throat self-consciously. He probably did that a time or two. So many gullible people to use. It was great calming down with this book in you, but it's late now and I'm tired, so good night. Good night, Alexis. Sleep well. My mother laughed. Remember who you're talking to, Ben? We never hold a little showmanship against a man. In fact, blue candles would be just the thing next time we play De, de Cocina. If you happen to find a couple tucked away somewhere, that is. I'll see what I can do, Ben said, his voice in this. Other signs. One of them is supposed to have eyes like a goat. Or no eyes. Or is it black eyes? I've heard that one quite a bit. I've heard the plants die when the Chandrian are around. Wood rots, metal rust, brick crumbles, he paused. But I don't know if that's several signs or all just one sign. You begin to see the trouble I'm having, my father said morosely. And there's still the question on, on if they share the same sign or have a couple each. I've told you, my mother said, exasperated. One sign for each of them, it makes the most sense. My lady's wife's favorite theory my father said but it doesn't fit in some stories the only sign is a blue flame and others you have animals going crazy and no blue flame and others you have a man with black eyes and animals going mad and blue flames i've told you i've told you how to make sense of that she said irritated tone dictating that they had this particular discussion before but you don't always have to be together they could go out in threes or fours if one of them makes fire stem, then they'll all look the same, as if they had all made the fire stem. That would account for the differences in the stories, different numbers and different signs depending on how they're grouped together. My father grumbled something. That's a clever wife you got there, Earl. Ben spoke, breaking the tension. How much will you sell her for? I need her for my work, unfortunately. But if you're interested in a short-term rental, I'm sure we could arrange a re- There was a fleshy thump followed by a slightly pained chortle by my father's baritone. Any other signs that spring to mind? He just got hit by a wife. He deserved it. <laughs> Jeez. They're supposed to be cold to the touch, though how anyone could know that is beyond me. I've heard fires don't burn around them. Though that directly contradicts the blue flame, I could, the wind picked up, stirring the trees, rustling leaves, drowning out what Ben said. I took advantage of the noise to creep a few steps closer, being yoked to the shadow, whatever that means. I heard my father say the wind as the wind died down. Ben grunted. I couldn't say either. I heard a story where they were given away because their shadows pointed the wrong way toward the light. There was another where one of them was referred to as shadow-handed. As something were shadow hand. Damned if I can remember the name, though. Speaking of names, that's another point I'm having trouble with. There are a couple dozen I've collected that I'd appreciate your opinion on. The most actually are been interrupted. I appreciate if you didn't say them out loud. Names of people, that is. You can scratch them in the dirt if you like, or I could fetch you some slate, but I'd be more comfortable if you didn't actually say any of them. Better safe than sword, as they say. There was a deep piece of silence. I stopped mid-sneak with one foot off the ground as if they'd heard me. Now don't go looking at me like that, either of you, Ben said testily. We're just surprised, Ben, came my mother with a voice you didn't see in the superstitious type. I'm not, Ben said. I'm careful. There's a difference. Of course, my father said. I'd never save it for the paying customers, Arl. He cut him off, irritation playing in his voice. You're too good an actor to show it. I know perfectly well when someone thinks I'm daft. 
I just didn't expect it, but my father said apologetically, you're educated, and so, and I'm so tired of people touching iron and tipping their their beer as soon as I mentioned the Chandrian. I'm just reconstructing a story, not meddling with the dark arts. You'll hear me out. I like both of you too well for you to think of me as an old fool, and I'll need you to take me serious for that. I wouldn't continue to pick up. I used the noise to cover my last few steps. I edged the corner of my parents' wagon and peered through the veil of leaves. Three of them were sitting around the campfire, and Ben was sitting on a stump, huddled in a sprayed brown cloak. My parents were opposite of him, my mother leaning against my father and the blanket draped loosely around them. Ben poured clay into a jug and leather mug and handed it to my mother. His breath fogged as he spoke. How do you feel? about demons of the Atur, he asked. Scared, my father tipped his temple. All the religion makes their brains soft. How about of the Vintons? A fair number of them, Tellins, do you feel, do they feel the same way? My mother shook her head. They think it's a little silly. They think their demons metaphorical. What are they afraid of in the night? In Ventus then, the Fae, my mother said. My father spoke at the same time. Jagar. You're both right, depending on which part of the country you're in, Ben said. And here in the Commonwealth, people laugh laugh up their sleeves at both ideas. He gestured at the surrounding trees. But here they're careful, come autumn time, to fear the drawing attention of the Shambolin. That's the way of things, my father said. Half of being a good trooper is knowing which way your audience leans. You still think I've gone cracked in the head, Ben amused. Listen, if tomorrow we pull into Byron and someone told you there were shamblemen in the woods, would you believe them? My father shook his head. What if two people told you? Another shake. Lean forward. What if a dozen people told you with perfect earnest that shamblemen were out in the fields eating? Of course I wouldn't believe them, my father said, irritated. It's ridiculous. Of course it is, Ben agreed. But the real question is this. Would you go into the woods? My father sat very still and thoughtful for a moment. That's a very good point, he makes. If you didn't believe in something and people said that that thing was out there, would you still go out there? You'd be a fool to ignore half the town's warning, even if you don't believe the same thing they do. If not shamblemen, what are you afraid of? Bears. Bandits. Good sensible fears for a trooper to have, Ben said. Fears that townsfolk don't appreciate. Every place in this little superstition and everyone laughs at this folk across the river, what the folk across the river think. He gave them a serious look. But have either of you ever heard a humorous song or story about the Chandrian? I'll bet a penny you haven't. My mother shook her head. And after a moment's thought, my, mother, my father took a long drink before joining her. Now, I'm not saying the Chandrian are out there striking like lightning from the clear blue sky, but folk everywhere are afraid of them, and there's usually a reason for that. Ben grinned and tipped his clay cup, pouring the last drizzle of beer out onto the earth. The names are strange names. Dangerous names. He gave them a pointed look. That I know is true, because I'm an educated man. If I'm a mite superstitious too, he shrugged. Well, that's my choice. I'm old, and you have to humor me. My father nodded thoughtfully. It's odd. I've never noticed that anyone treats the Shandri in the same. I, it's something I should have seen. He shook his head as if to clear it. We can come back to names later, I suppose. What was it you wanted to talk about? I prepared to sneak off before I was caught, but what Ben said next froze me in place before I took a simple, single step. It's probably hard to see, being his parents and all, but your young kvothe is rather bright. He began refilling his cup and held the jug out to my father, who declined it. As a matter of fact, bright doesn't begin to cover it, not by half. My mother watched Ben over the top of her mug. Anyone who spends a little time with a boy can see that, Ben. I don't see why anyone would make a point of it, least, least of all you. I don't think... You really grasp the situation, Ben said, stretching his feet. How easily did he pick up the loop? My father seemed a little surprised at the sudden change of topic. Fairly easily, why? How old was he? My father tugged thoughtfully at his beard. 
In Silence, my mother's voice was like a fleet. Eight. Think back when you lecture, you learn to, um, think back when you learn to play. Can you remember how old you were? Can you remember the sort of difficulties you had? My father continued to tug at his beard, but his face was more reflective now, his eyes far away. Abanthe continued. All but he learned each chord, each fingering, after just being shown once. No stumbling, no complaining, and he, when he did make a mistake, he never made it more than once, right? My father seemed a little perturbed. Mostly, he didn't have trouble. Just the same as anyone else. E chord. He had a lot of t trouble with the greater and diminished E. My mother broke in softly. I remember too, dear, but I think it was just his small hands. He was awfully young. I bet it didn't stall him for long, Ben said quietly. He does have marvelous hands. My, mo my mother would have called him magician fingers. My father smiled. He gives them from his mother. Delicate but strong. Perfect for scrubbing pots, eh, woman? My mother swatted him, then caught one of his hands in her own and unfolded it for Ben to see. He gets them from his father. Graceful and gentle. Perfect for seducing young noble's daughters. My father started to protest, but she ignored him. With his eyes and those hands, women wouldn't be safe in all the world when he starts hunting for the ladies. Courting, dear, my father correctly, corrected gently. Semantic, she shrugged. It's all chance. It's all a chase. The race is done. I think I take pity. I pity the chase women who run. She leaned back against my father, keeping his head on her lap. She tilted her head slightly. He took his cue and leaned in to kiss the corner of his mouth. Amen, Ben said. My father... <coughs> Mark water. My father put his arm around her and gave her a squeeze. I still don't see what you're getting at, Ben. He does everything that way, quick as a whip, hardly ever makes mistakes. I'll bet he knows every song you've ever sung to him. He knows more about what's in my wagon than I do. He picked up a jug and uncorked it. It's not just memorization, though. He understands. Half the things I've been meaning to show him, he's already figured out for himself. Ben refilled my mother's cup. He's 11. Have you ever known a boy his age that talks as he does? A great deal of it comes from living in such an enlightened atmosphere. Ben gestured to the wagons. But most 11-year-olds, deepest thoughts have to do with skipping stones and how, swing a, and how to swing a cat by its tail. My mother laughed like bells, and Abinthu's face was serious. It's true, lady. I've had older students that would have loved to do half as what he can do well. If I had his hands and one quarter his wit, he'd be eating off silver plates inside of a year. There was a lull, and my mother spoke softly. I remember when he was just a little baby, toddling around, watching, always watching, with clear, bright eyes, it looked like they wanted to swallow up the whole world. What is it that you suggest we do? Ben smiled gently. Nothing except to think about what options you might give him when the time comes. He will leave his mark on this world as one of the best. One of the best of what, my father said, whatever he chooses. If he stays here, I don't doubt he will become the next alien. My father smiled. Alien was the trooper's hero, the only truly famous Edmund Ra of all history. All our oldest best songs were his. What's more, if you believe in the stories, Alien reinvented the loot in his lifetime. A master luthier, Iliad transformed the archaic, fragile, and wielding court loot into a marvelous, versatile, seven-string trooper's loot that we use today. The same stories claimed Iliad's own loot had eight strings in all. Iliad. I like the thought of that, my mother said. Kings come from miles away to hear little Kavoth play. His music stopped show stopping barroom brawls and border wars. The wild women in his lap my father enthused, laying their breasts on his head. There was a moment of stunned silence, but my mother spoke slowly with an edge in her voice. I think you mean wild beasts laying their heads in his lap. Do I? Ben coughed and continued. If it decides to become an arcanist, I bet he'll have a royal appointment by the time he's 24. 
if he gets his head into to being a merchant, I have no doubt that he'll own half the world by the time he dies. My father's brows knitted together and Ben smiled. Don't worry about the last one. He's too curious for a merchant. Ben paused, as in half considering the next words carefully. He'd be accepted into the university, you know. Not for years, of course. Seventeen is about as young as they go. But I have no doubts about... I missed the rest of what Ben said. The university? Come to think of it? A school that size? About the size of a small town? Ten times ten thousand books? People who'd want to know all the answers to all of my questions I could ever ask? It was quiet when I turned my attention back to them. My father was looking down at my mother nestled at his arms. How about it, woman? Did you happen to bed down some wandering god about a dozen years ago? That might solve our little mystery. Oof. Bedtime stories. Yep. She swatted at him playfully and a thoughtful look crossed her face. Come to think of it, there was a night about a dozen years ago a man came to me. He bound me with kisses and cords of corded song. He robbed me of my virtue and stole me away, she paused. But he didn't have red hair. Couldn't be him. She smiled wickedly at my father, who appeared a little embarrassed. Then she kissed him, and he kissed her back. And that's how I like to remember them to this day. I snuck away with thoughts of the university, dancing in my head. It gets. We have such a good setup. And the setup is so masterfully done. I love the story. If you're wondering what I'm reading, we're reading Name of the Wind by Patrick Rothfuss. Uh, he hasn't finished it. Of course not. He'd rather play Skyrim. Um, but I think that's where we're going to end tonight. I am going to drink lots of water as we've been reading many chapters this evening and go watch an episode of Brooklyn Nine-Nine and go to sleep but thank you all for coming I hope I've read many of you to sleep just know that I love your faces and I will see you tomorrow good night